Welcome to 2819. This is the show where we aim to inspire you to go and make disciples of all nations. I'm Sandra Dimez. And I'm Brian Rombacher. And this is a television outreach of Reasons to Believe, a viewer-supported ministry where science and faith converge. And as you're watching, if you get inspired to just support resources like this show, visit reasons.org slash 2819. And if you're watching this show on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button below. Keep up to date on all the new videos that we're making. And you know, while you're there, you can also jump over to social media. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at 2819 Show. We'd love to hear from you. And for those of you that prefer the audio version of this, the 2019 Show is now available on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. Just search Reasons to Believe Podcast. Well, you know what time it is? Time, time for, for the, the rundown. rundown. <laughs> In our Nexus segment, Erica Carlson will discuss the question of how we can address the problem of evil with compassion. And in Culture Talk, Sandra will be interviewing Jeff Swearing, asking the question, do science and Christianity require faith? Good question. In our Give and Take segment, Jeff will talk with Hugh about what does water on Mars mean? What do you think it means? I don't know, but I'm just curious to find out if we can drink that water. Hmm. But first up in RTB 101, Krista will be talking with Fuzz Rana about the question, is there evidence for macro evolution? Let's check it out. Now it's time for RTB 101. This is the segment where we talk about practical questions to help equip you to share your faith with friends and family more effectively. And today we're talking about a very common question, can biological evolution explain the history of life? Now many evolutionary biologists argue that there is overwhelming evidence for what is called macroevolution. Here to help me talk about this provocative question is biochemist Dr. Fuzz Rana. Welcome back, Fuzz. Krista, it's good to be with you again. I think maybe the best place to start this conversation is defining the term macroevolution, because that might be a new term for many of our viewers. Yeah, well, sometimes people like to think about evolution in two distinct categories. Uh, microevolution, which would be variation that happens within a species, or, or events like speciation. So a quick example would be the peppered moths that, that we learn about in biology textbooks, whose wing color change from a a lighter wing color to a darker wing color in response to environmental pollution. And then the other category would be macroevolution. This is where we're looking at evolution that's driving a large scale biological change that typically involves some kind of innovation. So an example would be a wolf-like creature evolving into a whale. Okay, that's a great example in every high school biology text. Now, we have the position here at Reasons to Believe, we're skeptical that the evidence is all 100% going toward uh, supporting biological evolution. But if that's the case, then why are there so many people who believe in evolution? Yeah, well, I mean, th there are two categories of evidence that biologists will point to as evidence for macroevolution. One would be the fossil record that shows a, a history of life uh, that uh, progresses from simple to complex, where at different times in Earth's history, there are different life forms. And so the argument would be that we're seeing an ever-changing history of life on Earth. Therefore, there must be some mechanism driving large-scale evolution. And then the other evidence would be homologies, which is a $25 term that just means shared biological features found in organisms that naturally group together. And so it's these two categories of evidences that oftentimes are cited as evidence for macroevolution. So with that evidence in mind, that there is a case to be made for bio biological evolution, why then are we skeptical that macroevolution is, is true? Well, to me, one of the major sources of my skepticism is the nature of the fossil record. Yes, indeed, the fossil record does show different life forms at different times in Earth's history. But when we look at the history of life on Earth, we see these periods where there are these innovations that take place, major transitions in life's history, and they all happen explosively, not in a gradual, protracted manner like you would expect if evolution was driving this, but it suddenly, without intermediate grades, this is happening at the origin of life, the origin of eukaryotic cells, the origin of body plans. When we look at the history of vertebrates, we see what are called radiation events, where there's explosive diversification in a very narrow window of geological time. We see this for fish, for amphibians, for reptiles, three radiation events for birds, and then for mammals. 
And so I look at those radiation events as signatures for a creator's involvement because we don't have mechanisms that can account for that kind of rapid transition in an evolutionary context. The, the mechanisms that drive the change in the, the wing color of a peppered moth don't seem to be able to account for those kind of radical transformations. Very good. So when we think about microevolution, there's a lot of good evidence for that. But when we think about macroevolution, we kind of step back and we think, well, there could be some a better explanation here. It could be a creator because we see the fossil record seems to show these these very sudden appearances, which could be interpreted as divine interventions, if you will. Yes. Now, uh, what about this issue of homologies? Doesn't that kind of point to common descent from a, an ancestor? Well, really, what we are looking at here with homologies are patterns that then evolutionary biologists assume evolutionary mechanisms can account for them. But on the other hand, we could look at those patterns and explain them from a creation model or from a design standpoint, where the, the, the shared features could reflect common design, not common descent, where if you had an archetypical design in the mind of a creator, that archetypical design could be understood as then being physically manifested in these shared features. So the fact that the fossil record doesn't look like I would expect it to look and that we can explain homologies just as readily in a creation model framework as in an evolutionary framework, to me, tips the scale in favor of creation. So going back to our non-Christian friends, when we're talking to them about evolution, it can get hard for somebody like me who's not a scientist. I can get in the weeds really quickly in that conversation. So what can I do when I'm talking to somebody about evolution? Yeah, and I think what we want to do is avoid uh, saying that that there, there's no way that macroevolution could ever happen. There's no evidence. There's we don't no want to, evidence we don't for want to that. Say right. That. We don't want to say that. But rather what we want to do is point out where we see to, to be shortcomings in the theory with the idea that those shortcomings are hopefully disruptive enough to allow people to say maybe, just maybe, there might be a role for a creator in the history of life. And then we can bring to the table more positive evidences for why we think God is involved in, in life's uh, origin and history. So my job isn't necessarily to, to debunk evolution, it's just to ask some questions, well, how do you account for this? Have right. you thought about that? Right, because that, that, that raising that suspicion on their part is critical because many people say, well, if evolution can explain the history of life, why do I need a creator? So all we want to do is just raise enough questions to get them to think maybe, just maybe, a creator might be involved. Very good. And I want to invite you to check out Fuzz's blog. You can just go to reasons.org and search for The Cell's Design for more provocative articles and Fuzz's perspectives as a biochemist. Next up is Nexus, and we're going to be hearing from our friend physicist and RTB visiting scholar, Dr. Erica Carlson. And she's going to be talking about the question of how to address the problem of evil with compassion. Let's check it out. But I'm going to tell you about today the question that I fear the most, and that is the question of how in the world can a good and loving God allow evil? Now, the reason this is such a scary question to me is because this is never an intellectual question. It just isn't. Um, this is always a question from a wounded heart. It's always a question that's driven by something bad happened to me or something bad happened to my loved one. Um, and always in the context of, of a room full of people, there are always also other people there present who have had some serious evil done to them. So we have to be extremely delicate. This is the one question that comes up in apologetics that really, in my opinion, requires the most care um, and the most gentleness um, in order to, to give, um, I'm not gonna say a complete answer, uh, but in order to give some reason for the hope that's in us. And so because of the delicacy of the question, I always um, rephrase it in my mind. Rather than phrasing it as an intellectual question, how can a good and loving God allow evil? I rephrase it into a personal question. Something along the lines of, you know, something, something serious, you know, something like my baby sister was murdered last night. How is your God a good God? Okay, so I just always repersonalize it. And, you know, if you were talking with a friend or with a loved one who had 
genuinely experienced that recently and, and the wounds were still raw, you would never dive right in to, and you, you would not give them you know, the top five intellectual arguments for why that's compatible with the existence of God. That would be cruel to start with that. Um, you would just sit and spend some time grieving with your friend over the atrocity that they had um, experienced. So I just, you know, I encourage you um, uh, in thinking about how to address this question with our seeker friends, um, and, and even with Christians who have struggled with it or are still struggling with it, I still struggle with it, um, to remember the compassion, remember these are real stories that happen to, to real people, and that it's really never a, a purely intellectual question. For more on this topic, visit reasons.org and search The Problem of Evil. Now it's time for Culture Talk. This is the segment where we talk about the intersection of faith and pop culture and how culturally relevant topics can be used to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with Jeff Swearing, astrophysicist and Data5. That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today. Good to be here, Sandra. You know, I, we talk a lot about movies, and uh, there's this iconic scene in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It's called the Leap of Faith. It's often mm -hmm. referred to as that. And it's so often used in sermons because we talk about faith and, and what faith looks like from a Christian perspective, mm -hmm. that we take this leap of faith not knowing if there's anything underneath us. Um, so let's dive first into that question of what do we mean by the word faith when we're talking about Christianity? Well, I, I like the definition that Ken Samples gave. It says, mm -hmm. faith is confident, reli confident trust in a reliable or credible source. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's an aspect of that scene out of Indiana Jones where you think, okay, I've got no reason to believe this, but he does. And, that, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's really biblical faith. What mm -hmm. I think biblical faith is, or at least what I take Ken Samples to be saying, is that I have such confident trust that God is trustworthy and reliable, that even when he says things that are weird, mm -hmm. I can trust him. Right. You know, so like, you know, I moved out to California, last place on the earth I wanted to live, if I'm honest. <laughs> My wife was Ouch. pregnant, she had back problems, had no family out here, mm -hmm. moving all away from all of my support system. But yet I was convinced God was calling me out here. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a history of God had shown me his reality in high school and college and graduate school. And so there was this body of evidence I had that God's, God was worth following. So even though I did things that didn't make sense, I was following a confident and reliable source. Right. And that's good to, to make a distinction about is that you're following a reliable source. Mm -hmm. So when we study scripture and we come to know God as being reliable and trustworthy, and then we feel the Holy Spirit leading us a certain way, then it isn't a blind faith right. is what exactly. you're saying. Exactly, yes. Right? And that's kind of what that movie, the scene in the mm -hmm. movie portrayed is as blind. But the reality mm -hmm. of it is I was very confident on my move out here. And mm -hmm. that's what I've liked about science is that I've actually had a chance to study and understand what about creation supports the Bible. And I found there's a lot of support for the Bible. It's not just something I trust even though it doesn't make any sense. I mm -hmm. trust it because it makes sense of the world in which I see. And, and that's a good point because when we think about Christianity and how we're using science as an apologetics tool, mm -hmm. then we have even more evidence that we can look at and explore. And then we see even further evidence for the reliability and trustworthiness of, of God and of Scripture. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I find that the more I study creation, the more convinced mm -hmm. I am that the Bible is true. And the more I study the Bible, the more fascinated I am by creation. And right. so they really do work together. They, they, they give me confidence that both are really trustworthy and credible sources. So then when we look at nature and we look at, at what we're seeing from scientific evidence, um, is science completely grounded in, in fact or is there some element of, of faith that you think I mean, you got to be careful how you say that. Right, but, right. But at the end of the day, yes, scientists do exercise faith. They just mm -hmm. don't do it in the way that a lot would recognize. You know, mm -hmm. as a Christian, um, I go read the scripture. I've studied and I'm convinced it's, reli convinced it's reliable. So mm -hmm. I don't go and say, okay, is this section reliable or not? Mm -hmm. I've found that it's true, so I follow it. Well, scientists, as they study creation, they expect it to be reliable, they expect it to be orderly, understandable. Those things are things that we've kind of tested and shown to be true, so mm -hmm. we take them on faith, if you will. Uh, but a lot of times, scientists don't really ask the question, why do we expect creation to be that way? Mm. Well, if God created it, we expect it to be that way. But if it's just a brute reality that is, it could be other ways. So mm. there is this aspect of faith that even scientists exercise, just like a, a, a Christian exercises good, good faith, if you will. 
Well, that's really good to, to know that there's some uh, element of faith that uh, scientists might be engaging in. Mm -hmm. So I kind of see it as a way of finding common ground. So mm -hmm. if we're talking with a scientist or someone who's just really fascinated by science, how can we talk about faith from both a Christian and scientific perspective and do that to share our faith? Well, I think there's things you can do that go in and say, yeah, as a Christian, I really do want to test. I want to find the truth. That's what a scientist is really about mm -hmm. is finding the truth about how creation works. Well, mm -hmm. that same thing applies. We want to find the truth about what the Bible has told us. And so we test it and we study it and we understand it, we recognize that. Christians have been doing this for 2,000 years, if right. not more, so there's a big body of evidence there. But the same is true when we study creation. We want to figure out what's going on. We don't want to just decide the answer and then only go look and find the things we like. Let's go out and be confident studying the creation, knowing that God's revealed himself in creation, and when we properly understand it, it's going to agree with what scriptures have to say. Well, is there any resource that you would point someone to? Let's say you're talking with a scientist and they are kind of interested in this conversation. What would be a resource you would point them to? I would go look at a couple of things. Look on our website, anything that talks about Big Bang cosmology. I think that's a remarkable mm. correspondence between the Bible and mm -hmm. creation. But there's also a, a blog post that I wrote about how scientists exercise faith as well. And so it's, I, I forget the exact title of it, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, if you look for Do Scientists Have Faith, uh, it'll pop up. And that gives you some of the background of how right. scientists really do exercise faith just like good Christians yeah. do. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Jeff. If you'd like to hear more from Jeff, visit reasons.org and search impact events. Now we're going to head over to Give and Take, where Jeff will be talking with Hugh about what does water on Mars mean. Let's check it out. Hello, Jeff Zwerink again with Give and Take, the segment of our show where we look at scientific discoveries and just ask the question, what does that tell us about the Christian faith and how can we be more confident in its truth? Today, I'm joined again by my colleague and boss, Hugh Ross, and we're going to discuss what are the implications of finding water on the planet Mars. Hugh, it's good to have you here again today. Thanks. So this is, uh, again, one of those topics that uh, people looking for life on Mars, I think that's gone on for decades. I know back in the 1800s, they were finding canals, and that's a sign of life. And even in the 1990s, we found uh, meteorites that said that they had life in it, and all of that has kind of fallen by the wayside. But there's this exciting discovery of a what looks like a lake in the South Pole of Mars. So let's kind of flesh that out. What's the discovery, and what, let's, let's kind of look at what the implications well, are. Well, that's how it was announced in the popular internet articles, that they found this giant lake on Mars, right. 20 <laughs> kilometers across. But, uh, and people thought, well, maybe there's something we can water ski on. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when you read the peer-reviewed paper that was published, uh, they didn't use the word lake. They basically said, uh, we found this highly reflective spot at the south pole of Mars. And well, well, that sounds very... And I, I bring that... I, I just kind of want to highlight a point, is that um, very often we get the popular press description of it that seems somewhat sensational or dramatic or, oh, wow, this is great, uh, groundbreaking. And then you look at the data and the scientists tend to be a lot more reserved or conservative in what they're saying. Well, my advice is when you see a popular article like that, only read the ones that give you a link to the paper. Mm -hmm. So you can go there and make sure that they've done an honest job on it. But what they really found uh, was a subterranean high reflective layer uh, below the south pole of Mars. And uh, they said, we think it's liquid water. Mm -hmm. They weren't positive. They said, we got good evidence as liquid water. They were able to measure the dielectric constant. Mm -hmm. That was consistent with being liquid water. The reflectivity was consistent, but they were very clear. This is not definitive proof of a liquid water. Moreover, they weren't able to measure the depth. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think this is a deep lake. Well, it could be just maybe a couple of millimeters thick of water, thick enough to reflect. Right. Okay, so this is radar imaging of the planet, and in right. one particular region, uh, given the resolution, they look down and they see a reflective surface that's consistent with some sort of a layer of water, if you will. Um, how, what are the kind of the details? How deep was it underground? What was the extent of the region? It's more than a kilometer below the surface. Okay. And they were able to calculate, because you know, was, there was a lot of ice from the polar cap mm -hmm. weighing down on this. And they were able to calculate how warm the water could be. Okay. The warmest it could possibly be is 90 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Okay, and so that's that pretty of, chilly, obviously. That's pretty chilly, and we know water freezes at 32 degrees above 
Right. And so this is 90 degrees below. How does it stay liquid? And that was most of what the paper was all about. Mm -hmm. How do you have water liquid at that extremely cold temperature? And basically they concluded there's only one way to keep water liquid at that very low temperature. And that is if the water is saturated with perchlorate salts. Okay, so so the, the idea there, you know, it's the same thing when you go out uh, boiling water at high elevations. You put salt in and it makes it boil at a high temperature. Same thing, you put water or salt in water and it makes it freeze at a lower temperature, correct? Well, so the same principle? Like the antifreeze you put in your car if right. you live in a cold place. Okay. Uh, you, you alter uh, the chemicals of the antifreeze and it can stay liquid at a lower temperature. Okay, so this, this is, is the extreme low. You right. can't, as so, matter, matter of fact, what they're able to show is that no matter how concentrated the perchlorate salts, mm -hmm. if it gets colder than minus 95, it will not be liquid. So this is right at the edge, which again caused them some doubt. Maybe we didn't really see liquid water because we're so close to the edge where it could be liquid. And they basically made the point too, if you think this is an environment for life, uh, you're kidding yourselves. Mm -hmm. The concentration of salt is so great, uh, no conceivable life form can exist in this uh, liquid water. Plus the fact we're talking, it's really cold. Well, okay, so let's kind of explore the implications. We've got, let's just take it at face value. Say they've discovered some sort of water uh, reservoir underneath the surface. It's at high pressures, obviously, because it's sitting under a bunch of rock. It's pretty cold because of the temperatures. It's got a lot of salt in it. Um, probably has some mixture of dirt in there. It's probably not, you know, kind of the pristine lake water that, like, that we're well, looking at. Well, they said in the paper, maybe it's not a layer of liquid water. Maybe it's sludge. Right, okay. So, so But let's just take that. So what does that mean for our understanding of life in the universe? I mean, you know, uh, you got to have water for life. Uh, if we find this water, is there a reasonable shot of life being there? Well, but the conclusion of the paper is not only do you need liquid water for life, it's got to be the right kind of liquid water, and the liquid water they found is not the right kind. But there is, they had an optimistic note saying, hey, given that we found uh, this uh, layer of uh, conceivably liquid water, maybe we're going to find something somewhere else. D so, did they give any estimate of how much, how many of these might exist on Mars? Well, so far, this is the only place that the they found it. Not, okay. And it said it may be one big layer or it might be a bunch of small layers that are separated. So it could be a bunch of small brine ponds mm -hmm. or it could be a sludge. And basically ended the paper saying, we need to do more research because mm -hmm. we, we only have a vague understanding of what's going on here. Uh, let's drill down some more. But they were very cautious in saying, Let's not jump to the gun and think we've found a possible site for life. This is right. definitely not a possible site for life. Well, I know you've described a lot of that in your blog article, uh, you know, about finding water on Mars and is this is a shocker. And I know I've written another article. And one of the things that stood out to me about this that I'd like to get your comments on is that, you know, we're looking at Mars and we're very excited about a little bit of water that's about as cold as you can get it and still be water. It's got heavily salt content under a lot of pressure buried under a bunch of rock. And we're excited about that. You know, but you contrast that with Earth, and Earth is just swimming, if you'll forgive the pun, in water. I mean, there's water everywhere on Earth, and life just abounds on Earth. It's, it, it strikes me as telling that the best conditions we can find on Mars are in this relatively hostile environment, yet you compare that with Earth, and it's just teeming with life. Well, we that got, says something to we me. We got water in all the right forms. I mean, notice we got frozen water, liquid water, and mm -hmm. water vapor all in the right amounts and proportions. We got the right kinds of liquid water and we don't have too much or too little. I think that's one of the things that astronomers are beginning to recognize. It's the quantity and kind of liquid water that's crucial for life. So it's more than just finding water. There are other conditions. There are other conditions. With and it. Earth is actually quite water poor compared to what we would expect from comparable rocky planets. I mean, I've written to the point that we got about 500 times less water than what you'd expect on other Earth-like uh, planets. Mm -hmm. And so too much water can be a problem. Uh, just like for the rhyme of the ancient mariner, if you're out in the middle of the ocean with all that water out there, and if it's salty, that water isn't gonna help you. So Hugh, how do we use this discovery to share our faith? Basically point out just how wonderfully designed Earth is, that we not only have liquid water, we got it in the right form and the right quantity, and really nowhere else do we see anything like Earth that has water exactly the way we need it for life to be possible. Thanks, Hugh.
You know, it really is remarkable. When we look at Earth, it is just incredibly well designed for life. And even little bits of water found outside of the Earth just showcase how well it's designed. I would encourage you to go check out Hugh's blog. Go to reasons.org and search Today's New Reasons to Believe to get more information on how you can use this fascinating discovery to share your faith with others. That does it for us this week on 2819. We hope that the show has really encouraged you to share your faith and to do so with confidence and compassion. And if you want to support resources like this show, please visit reasons.org 2819. And also like and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at 2819 Show. We'd love to hear from you. Look forward to seeing all those likes and new comments. <laughs> See you all next week.